and they started shooting as soon as they came in. So people that were fleeing were were shot. And my uncle Jackie was the first person that was shot and, and killed fatally. But you think bloody Sunday happened over a whole town? You're talking two streets. It has to apply here. It has to. If this happened in Manchester or London, that the soldiers shot a whole lot of people on the streets for doing nothing, it would never be forgotten. But here we're told to sort of get over it. Well, so then, thank you for the invite, John. It's lovely to meet you finally. Um, I have a family connection to Bloody Sunday because my uncle was the first person killed on the day. So I accidentally sort of got onto this work because I just wanted to help the family out basically years ago. And I'm a writer. So I think all this sort of happened just because it was me, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but my Uncle Jackie, um, maybe you know the footage of the young boy being carried and there's a priest waving a handkerchief. And so a lot of people would know that that image. And so we grew up sort of surrounded by seeing Jackie every time Bloody Sunday was on the news. My Uncle Jackie, Jackie Duddy, his name was, uh, they, they showed the footage of Jackie dying, you know, his dying moments. So we were very sheltered as children, but we were sort of taught that our uncle went on a peace march and he was shot by soldiers. So... We were afraid of marches and soldiers. But beyond that, we were sort of kept sheltered, I think, in a, in a very big way, because I think it was the fear of what if, what if something happened to us, you know? Or what if we were, somebody was angry and, and wanted to, you know? So um, my family owned the white handkerchief from Bloody Sunday as well, from that day, Bishop Daly's white hanky. So it's the only item that we kept when Jackie's things came back from the hospital after he died. And my granddad burnt all the rest of his stuff, but he kept the white hanky. And then Bishop Daly didn't really know that we had it until uh, in the 2000s, I think, at the inquiry, when my auntie Kay turned up with it. And now it's in a museum for safekeeping, but it's been passed down to me. So now I'm the custodian of the white hanky. I even born until 1976. So uh, my brother wasn't even born. My mom was supposed to be married that year when Jackie died. And she put off her wedding and then... She, I think she put off her wedding three times because every venue was bombed. So she had to go keep getting further and further outside Derry to find a safe hotel. But that's that was the the, the way those days, you know, there was there was difficulties. So um I think whenever the families were campaigning, I didn't really know much either. I just knew about an aunt who was challenging the government. And she lived next door to us as children. So I sort of listened to all her stories. And I remember telling my friends that she took a, a petition to the 10 Downing Street to give to the uh, 10th, I think it was 40,000 signatures to get the campaign reopened, to get the investigation reopened. So I was very proud of her in that way, you know, that someone's taken on the man. And uh, I think that's what interested me, basically, when I started working with the families was they'd done something that just couldn't be achieved. You know, they actually changed history, British and Irish history. And it's a bunch of ordinary people. So I think that inspires me most, you know. Um. So I, I've, I've done a few projects with the families over the years and I worked on a book for the 40th anniversary about the campaign itself and how the families actually achieved what they'd done because nobody really spoke about, you know, how did you do this? And all the, all the individual stories were so fascinating. You know, I was so proud to be able to write about it and, and document it. And can talk to me. Uh, can you talk to me a little bit about the, the like collecting together and uh, all these stories? Because, I mean, I, I do it. In a sense, I, I, you know, I, I interview people like, like one by one, um, but you gathered together. I, I mean, how many, how, how many interview subjects for the book? Well, I think there's about a hundred and ten in the new book in the fiftieth anniversary book, but um, we were very careful to use what material was out there as well, because there's really no point going back to really elderly people now and re-traumatizing them and asking them the same story over again when it is documented. So I was very careful in that way, and luckily I know the family as well, and I know who's approachable and who's not and who's really spoken enough and you have to use what's out there. Like there was one wife left of, of someone that died and all the parents are long dead. So it was good to be able to get in those voices that are, that are long, long gone. So I used a lot of um, archive stuff, newspaper articles, archive oral history that they had done. And crucially the eyewitness statements from bloody Sunday from 1972 itself, all the widgery statements for the first inquiry and then for the Savile inquiry in the 90s, there's a wealth of information online. So in terms of documenting an event, Bloody Sunday is one of the most documented historical events I've ever come across. And 
it's sort of fascinating in that way. So you can see it from all angles, you know. So it was very important to sort of put, put a broad scope on the book because you can't really fit everything to do with it in one book. I had to be very choosy as well, you know. For all the stuff I put in, you could put you could make another book, you know, of what I've left out. I, I I'd imagine I, I'd imagine the, the the editing process must have been must yeah. have been incredibly tough. Um, g given given that you the I mean the the first person killed in the event was your uncle, um, and and obviously he was he was uh murdered before um before you were born. So like, was there a did was there a degree of like personal personal journey in it? I mean, you 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 were learning about the last day and last hours of of a man that that you unfortunately didn't get to know. Yeah. We should have, you yeah. know. I think it makes me feel a bit closer to him because we never knew him. He's just some fabled faraway uncle. But we knew of him because of all the TV stuff and because he's on murals and, you know, the, the, the street murals and he's on the cover of books and stuff. So it was a very visceral sense that he saw his picture everywhere. But all we knew that was that he was a young champion boxer and my mum was a sparring partner, you know. So we sort of saw a different side to him and, and the funny cheeky side that people tell stories about. So um, I'm, I'm really proud that I'm able to sort of traverse that family history and document it. And in terms of Jackie's last day, I got some absolute gold dust for the new book. And it was a letter that his best friend wrote to my aunt. And my aunt just came across it and said, here. And it was written in the 90s. And it just said, this is what me and Jackie done the night before. This is what we done that day. I lost him at the march. And then I heard later he was dead. And the night before, they were listening to um, an E.O. Morricone records and babysitting. And, you know, they loved Westerns, spaghetti Westerns. And they would go like a couple of times a week to Westerns and they loved music. And so it sort of really painted a picture of the person he was. So I asked permission for that to be used in the book. And that was amazing, you know, to see that it was a glimpse into who he was, you know. Um, okay, so uh, as you mentioned, the, the, obviously pe people people are familiar with the event. They know it, it wasn't just like some march or a gathering. It was it was a civil rights um, demonstration. Yeah. It was it was a peace march. Um, okay, so you might give us you might paint a bit of a context of the the civil rights process that was going on um, up until that point. Kind of what what the aims of it were, how how they went about it, even some of the ways in which. It, uh, people's um kind of protesting rights and, and democratic rights were being were being stamped down a bit you know and and and, and they felt they, they felt like they, they weren't getting a fair a fair shake in, in terms of yeah. well historically the the nationalist catholic population here in the north they've been you know they've been oppressed um because the the british government and the british army well the the, the police and everything here were quite hostile. So Northern Ireland was very much made as a Protestant. What's the, the quote? They have a Protestant state for a Protestant people. Uh, so Catholics had to fight for their, their way the entire time. And while um, Protestant people would have had the right to vote and they would have owned property, if you didn't own property, you didn't have a vote. And so so the voting was overwhelmingly um, against Catholic uh, representation as well. So the original civil rights movement was brought about just because of necessity. There was no jobs, there was no investment, there was no votes, uh, there was no adequate housing. You know, people were living with um, six families in one house. You know, it was severe overcrowding and, and degradation, particularly in the bog side area. I'm pointing at it down here, the bog side area. Um, people, it was it was a real, it was a, almost like a ghetto before, you know, in the coming up to the 1960s. And it's all been redeveloped now. But I feel the civil rights movement had to begin, had to start because the people had to sort of take a stand and try and change things. And I'm really lucky to know some of those original civil rights leaders. And my God, they're powerful people, you know. They just, they don't realize the power that they had. And so in 68, when they started marching for civil rights, um, they had some limited success after a campaign of civil, civil disobedience. And they were able to achieve, you know, some slight, slight reforms, but the March on Bloody Sunday was particularly about internment, which came on, you know, later. And it was basically an, an arrest policy, you know, for arresting nationalist or Republican people. And most of whom were interned, had nothing to do with the IRA or anything like that. It was, it was more against a population, you know, a community. And no so, and trial. Yeah, internment without oh, no. Yeah. Go on, go on. Ah. 
Yeah, so the March on Bloody Sunday was actually against internment. And uh, if you were interned, you know, you were no trial, no questions, nothing. You were just thrown in jail. And for um, even for throwing stones in a riot, you were given an automatic six month sentence here. So there's a lot of young men that had criminal records just for doing what all their friends were doing. So, um, so civil rights, I think, did change things here. You know, we have got uh, more equality. The housing was, you know, the, the the votes were eventually given to us. So I think we're on an even keel now, but I almost feel like the civil rights movement has come full circle now. And we need to take to the streets again because the, the cost of living crisis is so bad that we're nearly back to 1968 standards here again, you know, with the poverty and the degradation. You might um um there's two um there's two events that when you're when you're telling the story of Bloody Sunday it's it's quite important to to tell them also and I'm I, I'm referring to uh I'm referring to the Valley Murphy massacre and and before that um the Battle of the Bogside which um ultimately led to Brit British soldiers the, the very the very very British soldiers who who shot the who shot into the crowd and them being brought in. So yeah, you you might give us like a brief overview of um of those two events and their significance in relation to what, what... was the first one? Bally Murphy and what else? What was the other one? Uh, the Bogside Battle of the Bogside. Oh yeah, yeah. So the Battle of the Bogside was in nineteen sixty nine, and it was basically after the um the Bogside overlooks um um the prop the last Protestant enclave on the city side too, and there was always clashes between those two communities. And Battle of the Bogside was basically um, the RUC at the time, who were a very heavy-handed, brutal police force and overwhelmingly um, unionist. They um, joined forces with the people on the streets, basically, and, and, and battling the people of the Bogside back into the area. And the people just stood up to them. And so the Battle of the Bogside was basically a riot that went on two and a half, three days. And it, it did change things, the Battle of the Bogside, because it brought an international perspective to, to what was going on here. But more than that, the first, what we would call the first civil rights march in October, 5th of October, 1968, that actually brought pu public attention to what was happening in Northern Ireland because there was about 500 people on a civil rights march and the RUC swooped in and battered everybody. And there was a, a, t a TV camera for RTE News, which is the Southern News here. And so that footage went all over the world and they thought, what the hell is happening here with the police brutality? So um, October 6th date was a big precursor. And then when it spilled over over the year, by October, by August 1969, um, the people of the Bogside had had enough and, and they stood up for themselves. So the Battle of the Bogside really was just that, you know, and I think everybody had a part to play at the time. You know, I spoke to someone who said my daddy was too ill to take part. So we just carried a wheelbarrow up and down to the front line of the barricades with stones in it. And, you know, we just kept the front line uh, as, uh, with enough stones so the, everybody sort of had a wee part to play even if they couldn't actively go and fight the the police and, and the rioters it, it's and, uh, sorry it, it is important I, I've interviewed um, ex RUC men before um, and yeah it, it's important to it's important to stress that that I mean, the the nationalist community re really felt like the the law enforcement agencies weren't weren't with them at all. Yeah, they they yeah. were very much against them. Yeah, it, it, it's it's important to because I mean, you can understand it, it makes it makes a decision to join like a paramilitary group like the IRA or, or others. It, it it makes that a lot more understandable when um when you feel like your back is to the wall and the yeah. The, the agents of force that do exist uh, are against you. So, so of course they're going to turn to uh, another group, even if they don't do things exactly the way the way you'd like. Yeah, and the RUC were particularly brutal. And a few months before the Battle of the Bogside, and it, um, it sort of was a precursor to it. Was there was a local man, Sammy Devaney, and he was standing at his front door talking, and a few rioters were trying to get away from the police and ran into his house, and the police ran on after them, and they beat Sammy Devaney almost to death in front of his children and they beat him so bad that his glasses were embedded in his face here and uh, there was blood all over the walls and everything I've spoken to a few of his children and people that were there and the anger of that that the police could do that to an absolutely innocent uh, working class father and he died a few months later of his injuries he had a massive heart attack and never ever recovered so that as well was the backdrop to the Battle of the Bogside so they really had had enough of, of, of the brittle police force and after three days and nights of fighting at Battle of the Bogside, 
that was when the government said, send in the British Army. So I think that's pivotal, is that they couldn't, um, the police couldn't control the people here. And the decision was, was to send in the troops for, I think it was three months originally, and they stayed for decades. So again, you can okay. sort of see where, <laughs> yeah. And originally people were welcoming the, I was going to say the Brits there, but, but we would say the Brits, you know, as just to shorten it, but um, people welcomed the army when they got here thinking, whoa, they're here to help. But after a few months, it became clear that they were, they had the same agenda as the police and the government and and things just got steadily worse. So all that really led to what happened on Bloody Sunday and in Belfast, Bally Murphy was six months before Bloody Sunday, and nobody really knows about it. And Bally Murphy is just like a small housing estate in West Belfast. And the day that internment came in, um, it was around the 11th of August in six, uh, internment, 72, 71 internment came in. And over three days of internment coming in and the troops going through communities, they killed 11 people in Bally Murphy including a priest who was waving a white hanky, including a mum who was shot in the face, and they left her to die in a field. And it was, the the, the thought is, is it was exactly the same regiment from uh, the paratroopers that done Bally Murphy. And if they had been cautioned after Bally Murphy, clearly they would never have been sent under Derry to police a peaceful civil rights march in January 1972. So Bally Murphy is crucial to understand in Bloody Sunday and the mindset of the British government and indeed the military in trying to control the masses here. And Bally Murphy families only got an inquest. They never even had a police investigation. They had their inquest last year, year before, you know, recent years. And one woman found out her mammy was alive in the field after being shot in the face for hours that day and nobody would let the family up. You know, that's 40 odd years later, 50 years later, they find out these things. So, and they'll never have an inquiry like we had or anything, you know, but they got an inquest and they got some truth. But uh, I think deliberately they let the Bloody Sunday inquiry spiral so there'll never be another one like it. You know, so uh, Bally Murphy, I think, is is fascinating in terms of of what it led to. Mm. I was going to say it's, 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 far, it's far less well known and may, maybe some of that is due to the fact that, that it took place over, over three days instead of, instead of yeah. like an event on one day. Doesn't, doesn't change the... Um, doesn't change how horrendous it is or anything. Oh, on, on in Bally Murphy, there was no, but for the anti internment march here on Bloody Sunday, there was photographers from all over the world. There was press from all over the world. People sort of had a feeling something would go wrong or something was going to kick off. So there was so much documentary evidence of what happened here, but it all went under the, it was all brushed under the carpet and there was no photographs, no footage. And, you know, so Bally Murphy very much was a hidden massacre, whereas ours was a very, very publicly documented one. Okay, so so getting to uh getting to Bloody Sunday itself, um the the march itself was actually illegal, not not to justify yeah. any any kind of anything, but but um yeah, it's 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 worth mentioning that uh the the British government, I mean, it's very um it's it's very anti anti freedom of expression and kind of anti freedom of speech to be, to be banning uh to be yeah. banning marches like this. But yeah, you you might kind of you might kind of talk to us about um that decision to to ban marches how how long it had been, it had been going on etc. Uh I think it came and went, but um they just really didn't want public disobedience. And you know that's actually coming back again now the British government are again planning to um clamp down on protesters and you know if you haven't got the right to protest, uh, where's our democracy, you know? So um, again, that's scarily coming full circle. But um, even though the march was um, illegal, it didn't stop anyone going on at all. All marches and gatherings were illegal, but um, there wasn't really a heavy police or army presence at them usually. You know, this one w went, was overkill, the Bloody Sunday one. You know, they were drafting on people the day before and there was troops brought in and that it could have been policed a lot easier. But so I don't think the illegal march thing, uh, you know, if all marches were illegal. Mm, they just didn't really like um, demonstrations on the street. Fair enough. OK, so um, we might begin. Th th there's so much there's so much about the day to, to kind of cover. But but you might take us through the the kind of broad strokes of of, of how it began. Yeah. Well, um, the march began um, in Cragen, which would be another um, Catholic nationalist housing estate. And Craigan was built when the bog side was overflowing and to try and keep the gerrymandered votes going. And 
they tried to still cram everybody in and they made another park going up a hill, Craigan. So um, it started in Craigan and wound its way down through the bog side. And on the day that a few speakers to speak to listen to, including Lord Fenner Brockway, uh, in the bog side. But of course, the speakers never really got to speak much. Um, I also included Brockway's comments in my book too, because I was I found some, you know, of what he said on the day. And he said there was there was no madness. There was nobody. It was women. It was grannies. It was people with prams. Very interesting to hear his point of view as well, you know. Um, and he was just ushered off the podium and sneaked away. But basically, when the march was, I think people say there was like 25,000 people on the march. So it must have been really huge. And the whole way down from the Craigan, everywhere everywhere they saw, they saw barricades and all the side streets blocked off by the army. And crucially, the paratroopers, there was rumours that the paras were in town. So it was the, the normal army, I think, at most of the barricades. But it was the paras that were sent under the bog side and they end up. So there they were only rumours at that point in the afternoon. And I think everything was going safe enough until people saw snipers in the windows just before they got down towards the bog side. And they had already said the army is blocking off our destination. They were supposed to be going to the city centre, to the guild hall. And there was a barricade there, barricade 14 set up. So knowing that just ahead of the march, they said, let's go to Free Dairy Corner instead, a, a normal meeting place. But a lot, of, uh, a lot of the breakaway marchers just went on down to Barrier 14 and had a wee breakaway riot, as is normal in those days. You know, there was riots every day. And um, while the rest of them, thousands went on over into the bog side. And it was the breakaway marchers, the breakaway rioters, really, and sent to the army there at Barrier 14. But then also the paras had came in and tried to block off the streets and tried to corral people into the bog side. And it was when the paras came in, really, that all hell broke loose. And there was two people shot a few minutes earlier than everyone else. John Johnson was in his 50s. He was uh, shot twice and he died a few months later of his injuries. So he would be considered the fourth, 14th victim. So he, that's where 14 comes from. And then Damien Donahue was a 15-year-old boy and um, he was bending down to get a rubber bullet because you could sell them to tourists for a fiver sometimes. And he was shot in the leg when he was trying to retrieve the rubber bullet. And he still suffers with his injuries too. So he survived, but the wounded are, you know, they're they're lifelong wounded, most of them. Um, and then after that, um, the paras were sent, you know, to advance under the bog side. But crucially, they were given a, a warning from their commander. Um, do not, uh, what was it? Do not conduct a running battle under the bog side down Roswell Street and that's exactly what they done they did conduct a run and battle and they started shooting as soon as they came in so people that were fleeing were were shot and my uncle Jackie was the first person that was shot and, and killed fatally but you think bloody Sunday happened over a whole town you're talking two streets and when I'm doing talks with people and it's a walk you know when you can actually say it happened here it happened here when you see how small the area is I think that's more shocking and you can imagine thousands there and the crack, crack of the shots and people realised that's not normal bullets. It's not rubber bullets. What is that noise? And it was live rounds. And by the time people sort of realised it was live rounds being shot, people were already dead. So um, there was 28 uh, altogether. I think there was 18 injured and 13 dead on the day and another one later. So the army really did. Um, you know, it was really bad. And you could put the you could put the shots down to a couple of soldiers, you know, a handful, and particularly one who um, shot four people on the day and injured another four, um, and that's Soldier F, who's being um, prosecuted currently for two of the people that he killed. The other two is not being prosecuted for. I was going to ask you there from uh, from the first bullet being fired to the last. What 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 type of time time span are we talking about? About 10, 10 to 16 minutes. Very, very quick. And on a quarter, the whole thing was only over over a quarter of an uh, hour. Uh, so it was about five past four or something. It was all over by about quarter past, 20 past four. Do you know um do you know the the alias of the the soldier that, that killed your uncle? Uh well, we we sort of we've always known some names, but uh the I think it was R killed my uncle Jackie but they never really could be certain but we never got any prosecutions anyway and because they could never be certain 
But there are some soldiers that they're very certain on. And so that's really sad for those families, you know, when the evidence is there. Uh, all the soldiers were given ciphers, alphabet soldiers, because it was to protect them. And that has lasted over 50 years. But people in Derry have sort of known their names over the years. We just wouldn't use them, you know, because that would un that would interfere with our case if we used them. But was, now, I, you know, you see the names on, on lampposts and stuff all around the place, you know. Oh, mm. interesting. I, I, I didn't know they'd be written in public. I, I've seen them. I've seen they them. They are. I see them now. I'm be shocked because we've been trying to keep that down for years in case it interfered with the case. But it's not the families is doing it. It's the it's the public, and you can see lists. You know, sell a tape the lampposts with the lists of ciphers and their real names. I've so seen, there's I've, an anger there. I think that they've been protected all these years. Mm. Of course, I, I I've seen on Twitter. I I I can't think of it off the top of my head, but but I, I remember seeing Soldier F's um name the other day. Um. Okay. So uh, in the in like the immediate days after. D days and maybe weeks like like what what was the do you know what the like the average general narrative amongst the uh, people in Derry was about what happened if, if you were to ask one of them if you were to ask one of them like like tell me in a, in you know in a few minutes what what, what actually happened that day do, do you know what the general kind of narrative was the Derry people knew exactly what happened that it was a peaceful march and that they were fired upon but that's the lie that went out straight away after the killings was that the IRA fired first. And of course, that lie made its way around the world before the evening was out. And the British uh, military put it out on a press release to all the British um, embassies all over the world. And so it was on the front page of the New York Times the next day that there was an IRA gun battle in the bog side. So we were fighting a, a propaganda machine from, from the first moment. And that was very crucial, I think, to people here was that Derry didn't fire first, you know, it was really unprovoked and that has all been proven out. So that's that's really, really good that it proved to the whole world that Derry people were telling the truth all these years. And while there was a riot there and while I'm sure there was IRA men on the march, they weren't there active, they weren't there to do anything. And there was an actual warning given that day, you know, that stay away from the march in case anything happens. So most of the IRA that day were actually away from the march and out of, totally out of the scene. So, um, the fact that they had the, you know, that they called all our people IRA people. They said my uncle Jackie was a, a bomber, a nail bomber. And, you know, Jackie was a boxer. And what we remembered from him dying was that Bishop Daly, Father Daly at the time, he said he was running away and the army was coming behind him. And, and I looked and there was a young boy running beside him. And the young boy looked at a priest running and sort of laughed <laughs> at the idea of a priest running. And then he fell forward. So I really, you know, what was Jackie doing wrong there, laughing at the sight of a priest running, you know, that sort of, and Bishop Daly didn't actually know that he was hurt until he looked back and the wee boy hadn't moved and they went back and realised, God, this boy's been shot. So, um, what was your question there? I got tangented, I went on a tangent. That's great, I I, I, I can't quite remember. Um, uh, I, I was going to ask you next, um, Okay, so we we have a, a lot a lot of things. It, it's very easy to form a picture about something years later, decades later, when there's been reports and inquests and all yeah. reports and so on. Like how long, uh, how long before like there was a publicly available knowledge of the autopsy report of of these these various people, like like shot in the back, that 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 being the significance of it for, for you're this. talking the nineteen nineties. Mm. 1990s that was when the family started thinking you know gee we need to we need to do something here and I think that was inspired a lot by what happened to the Guildford Four and the Birmingham Six um, because there was lo local um, angles to all those stories and the fact that the, both of those groups could campaign and get out on a miscarriage of justice because they were um, accused of murder that they didn't do and watching that on TV and I think it was 89, one of them was, and the other was 91. The families here were thinking, God, if they can do it, what about us? Because it wasn't just the people that died that were called terrorists or nail bombers or gunmen. It was their families were tarred with the same, you know, they were, uh, and the wounded as well. The wounded were absolutely harassed everywhere they went for years because they were connected to Bloody Sunday. So um, it was very important, I think, to clear their names and clear the names of, of the dead. Um, you you might go into a little bit um uh about afterwards the what what kind oh, of yeah oh yeah I was, yeah 
I meant I meant specifically in regards to um like marches from now on because I mean like like you said you you naturally grew up with with a fear of of going to march yeah. and and soldiers because of what happened so um yeah did did marches did marches and kind of public uh, gatherings to decline a lot or I don't think they declined I think there was just a an air of caution around them from then on and from the year after Bloody Sunday they had an annual march which lasted until we got the declarations of innocence in 2010. But there is still a march every year. But the majority of families have decided that they don't want to march anymore, but some still do. So there is still a march for human rights and other justice cases every year. Um, but in the immediate aftermath of Bloody Sunday, I think there was such a shock hanging over Derry that they were almost immobilised for a long time. And even while the British government had already started the lie about um, the IRA gun battle, People here hadn't even known who, who was dead yet. And the numbers kept rising by that night. And I think my aunties were playing cards and waiting for Top of the Pops or something like that. And they heard on the radio about a boy being shot in Chamberlain Street. And they didn't know that that was their brother they were talking about. You know, so when you when you see all that, and they had to go to the morgue in, in our local hospital. And in the morgue, there was just a body full of, a room full of bodies with white sheets on them. And, you know, blood all over the floors and the stories of people having to go over and actually find out where their loved one was. It was hard one for me to hear. And my Auntie Kay always talks away about it, but I didn't realise until I was writing the book last year, year before, my mum was at the morgue. My mum was at the hospital, but she was sort of forgotten over time. So she told me that and I put her in the book and says, now, you, you know, I just wanted to correct history because we always just thought it was Kate done everything. But my mum, and then... One of our local civil rights leaders said he spoke to the two Dottie girls at the hospital, which reinforced that my mum was there, you know. So I think people just sort of forgot. And my mum would be a very quiet person anyway. She wouldn't have been a campaigner. She's in the background. So it was nice to put her story back in. But imagine the trauma of having to go and find out yourself if your loved ones was killed, you know. And one boy, the only guy who was not declared innocent in the new inquiry, um, Jared Donaghy, his body went missing for two and a half hours or something before he reached the hospital. And by the time he reached the hospital, there was nail bombs in every one of his pockets. And he was wearing like really tight denim, you know, like a Wrangler outfit, top and bottom. And his trousers were so tight that he couldn't get his cigarettes under his pocket and they had to carry them. So how would he have had nail bombs in every pocket? So they had to open his trousers and everything. And crucially, the bullet that killed him went through his pocket here. And there was a nail bomb in that pocket too. So they... Yeah, we'll never, ever stop talking about the planting of the nail bombs. So when everyone else was declared innocent, almost 50 years later, they said Jared was innocent, but he probably had nail bombs on him throughout, which was heartbreaking, heartbreaking for the family. But it was because he was the only person had any links to republicanism. He was in the youth wing of the IRA, the Fianna Fail, which was like, you know, a lot of people were. So that was why they could use him as a scapegoat, I think. So we always still talk about him and we've done booklets about the case and evidence and clear cut, you know. But, hmm. The uh, Bloody Sunday probably served, I mean, it's tough to gauge, but like it, it probably served as one of the best recruitment tools for the IRA um, in, in the whole thing. I mean, Peter yeah. Taylor, Peter Taylor himself, very famous um, journalist and author I've, I've had the pleasure of interviewing him actually he said himself that if he were a young man who, who'd who grown up in Derry like a young Derry resident he he, he said he'd have joined Derry yep. straight off and when he said that that made headlines here you know how dare Peter Taylor say something that was probably all right to say you know it was, it's an opinion and he's allowed an opinion but uh, Peter Taylor's been a great help over the years here you know trying to bring a, a, a you know because he's a British journalist Having his support was very good because he could see he could see the damage that was done. Um, but yes, it was certainly the best recruitment the IRA ever had, and a lot of people talk about that in their stories, their interviews with me, you know. And there was queues queues outside the doors waiting to join up afterwards because there was this flock of angry, disenchanted young men who had just seen their friends killed. Of course, they were going to want to do something, and that was all that was available to them at the time. Maybe was to join up and. And try and fight back. So that co that in itself, I think, caused a generational hurt because of the IRA then as well. So as uh, Bloody Sunday has a lot to answer for in that respect. I think if it hadn't been for Bloody Sunday, the troubles wouldn't have went on so long. 
and because of Bloody Sunday, we got decades more. So, um, like you mentioned, uh, the the kind of legacy of this event goes like way beyond the day itself. There's been, as you mentioned, that there's been two like uh, in inquiry inquest um type yeah. things into it. The, the the first the first wasn't um uh, wasn't received as being like kind of satisfactory at all. You you might uh you might go through um the the two. It was the the widgery and uh, yeah. you the widgery whitewash we would call it the widgery whitewash. Well, compared to the inquiry that I saw in my own lifetime, the, the Widgery Inquiry was set up in the days after Bloody Sunday. And it took, uh, I think it happened about a week or two later. And it only took part, took sat, sat for six weeks and it had a 36 page report. That was it. You know, it was a tiny, tiny thin report. And they have one on the museum. And, you know, that that's your report. And it basically said it shouldn't have been marching. It was a legal march. And the soldiers done a good job. And even when the soldiers were on the stand for widgery, they were, you know, they weren't asked the right questions. Their information, you know, you could tell by their, crucially, evidence-wise, you could tell there was a doctrine process went on with the army um, statements. You could see, you know, that all came out when the campaign was doing was doing all their research, that you could see a doctrine process in those three or four different versions of soldier statements. Water down, water down, water down, safe. You know, so um, widgery was basically, it protected the army. And I think the night before the Widgery um, Tribunal was announced, there's a famous memo that was unearthed in the 90s too between the Prime Minister at the time, um, Edward Heath, and Lord Widgery. And Heath said to Widgery that, do remember that we are not in Northern Ireland fighting just a military war, but a propaganda war too. And having that, you know, and writing, that's the, 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 the Heath Widgery memo. Things like that are dynamite for writing, for writing a book or for reigniting a campaign. You know, so from the outset, it was said, you know, make the army look good. Make us come out of this okay. So, um, again, Widgery was not accepted here. I think my granddad, who's long dead, he really thought, oh, they'll realise what they've done wrong and they'll apologise. You, you know, which was a very naive thought. But, of course, you would think that. And he died without ever getting answers. And there was 15 brothers and sisters in my mum's house. And their mammy had just died about two years before and the youngest was two, and then Jackie was murdered too. So God knows what my mum's house was like growing up. I really feel for them that way, and my granddad was never the same. But Widgery just didn't solve anything for anyone. And so it took the guts of 40 years, maybe 30 years, to set up the new, to set up 19, the, the actual campaign was only a few years in the 90s, but because of that, we brought international attention to it. There was all this new evidence, and the families were told, if you get new evidence, there's a chance. See the amount of evidence that came out? Shocking. And still to this day, historical cases here, there's only evidence only coming out now. And the British government's trying to shut down all legacy investigations because they know that stuff's coming out now. But it was so handy for the families in the 90s. You know, it was a clear-cut case. And so the second inquiry compared to Lord Woodrace lasted 12 years from start to finish. The, vo the, the report itself is 10 volumes of material and it was absolutely in depth it didn't get all the answers i would say savile's definitely not perfect he didn't lay the blame with it he did say it was wrong he did say we were innocent we got an apology but he didn't there was no military or soldiers or anything um blamed or reprimanded or anything like that you know so while savile was welcome it didn't really vary from widgery in that respect that's nobody ever paid for it you know mm. Um, on that, that that bring that brings us nicely into the the topic of um justice and trying to get, um you know trying to get some kind of uh, I I guess the word I I guess the word is is justice um but like n none of the none of the men who who shot that day have faced any kind of um you know prison or or, or legal yeah. I'm sure yeah. in their in their lives I'm sure yeah in in their in their military careers yeah. Um, but in yeah. the military careers, they were promoted and given decorations by the Queen. Uh, all of them? Yep. Even Soldier F was mentioned in dispatches after Bally Murphy. You know, in military dispatches, so he done a great job, whatever he done. You know? Um, yep. So they were decorated, and um, General Ford, who was overseeing um, Bloody Sunday, General Ford was given an OBE or something the year after by the Queen. 
you know, so while our people were licking their wounds, they were getting decorated and sent on their way. And of the few soldiers that were ever prosecuted for anything here, I think there was four or something, uh, every one of them got out of jail early and joined, rejoined the forces. So, no, there was no lessons learned there. And I think essentially that's what should be the big question here. What lessons have they learned? Can this happen again? And essentially it can because the army have never been sanctioned for it. They've never been, you know, they've never apologized. And they would still say that it was it was our fault. So we're, you're fighting an uphill battle there. But the rule of law has to apply here. It has to. If this happened in Manchester or London, that the soldiers shot a whole lot of people on the streets for doing nothing, it would never be forgotten. But here we're told to sort of get over it. So that's why it spanned 50 years. There was no investigation at the time. By the time the families had the strength to come together and say, what can we do? You know, those same families are pensioners now. It took over their whole lives. So, and we're not the only case. There is so much more than Bloody Sunday. The families campaign in their whole lives for basic, you know, basic rights, basic police investigations for the rule of law to apply here. So um, there's still, still a lot of problems, I think, with that respect. And we have one soldier in the dock, Soldier F. Um, will we ever see him prosecuted? Who's to say? But the fact that it... They, they said a few times that there wasn't enough evidence and the case was over and he probably thought, ooh, and then they said, no, we're, we're, we're reigniting the case again. And so at least Soldier F has, has got that worry over him and that's sort of, you know, I don't think he'll ever be reprimanded, but at least he'll think, God, I did do wrong, you know. Just more of a, I, I guess it's more of a kind of a, kind of a philosophical question, but like, like all these decades later, like Soldier F, I mean, he's, He's like an elderly man, as as are the rest of them. Do you think there's any there's any kind of utility or justice to be gained from from convicting like an old man for uh for for a crime he committed so many decades ago? You you could ask the same question of like you know a serial killer who maybe who oh. got caught decades later. But yeah, oh. do, do you think do you think there's um there's actually something to be gained from from like prosecuting an old man for for something he did decades ago. More of a more of a philosophical question. Certainly, so I don't th I don't think maybe you should throw him in jail and throw away the key because that's not going to happen. And I think because of the terms of the Good Friday Agreement, he might only have to serve two years if he is um, convicted. But I do think that as soldiers, you know, you're supposed to be protecting civilians, and we were civilians here. So that in itself should have a alarm bells ringing you know and I think if he does spend a day in jail I would be very surprised but we can't just not try because if we don't try here I say we it's not me who's doing the hard work it's all those people who have worked over the years I just write about it from far away really and, and support them um they have to try because otherwise people can get away with anything so it has taken a long time and there is an element of why now but because we couldn't get anywhere until now, you know? So it's really sad that these people have spent their whole lives fighting for something that they might not ever see Soldier F put in jail or, you know, just reprimanded. My mom doesn't want to see him go to jail because she's quite content with the Savo report and people saying that Jackie was innocent and saying that dairy people were telling the truth all along and that our name has been, you know, cleared so she's quite happy with that and a lot of the family you know I don't know it's a personal choice really if you want prosecutions I don't see the point in sending old men to jail but I do see the point in reprimanding our uh, killer soldiers you know regardless of age so even if they just like t took his medals off him and disgraced him that would be quite enough for me uh, the the book you you might you might tell us the name of the book again and um, fantastic if anyone if anyone wants to to get like a lot more detail on the book oh it's back to front here I think no, it's, no, on it's, it's okay no it's okay <laughs> it's on bloody Sunday anyway and it's published by Octopus um for the fiftieth anniversary and a softback came out too and it is it's I'm really really it seems like a culmination of all those years of me interviewing people and and pulling all these stories. And the fact that someone came to me then and said, would you do a book? And I thought, yes, I can do this book. You know, it was, a, I was going to say a pleasure to write. It certainly wasn't. It was an absolute nightmare to write. But I felt like it was it was supposed to come to me. And it was a culmination of many years of, of trying to document this. 
Mm. Right. Sure. I, I I can only imagine being in your position and having that uh that personal connection to it. The I I think the want the want to to get the whole thing straight in your head would be a lot more um given 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 your uncle was involved. You know. Ah, uh, definitely. And you don't want to pass it down to the next generation. You know, we're very lucky that we were sheltered. You don't want to pass owls from the last generation down to my child now. You know, so I, I think it's it's important as well that we sort of put these things to bed when, when we can. And if, if there is, I don't think there's ever going to be a closure about Bloody Sunday, but certainly it is coming towards an end, you know. And naturally that's because it's taken 50 odd years and a lot of the people originally involved have, have died. And I think the British government are banking on that, that all the families here, not just Derry, all the families here looking for answers will be, you know, will be dead by the time they get them. And there's there's still files in, in the British government that, are closed to 2067 and stuff until everybody involved in that family are dead. You know, it stinks, it stinks. So there's a lot more work to be done, a lot more cases being fought out there, not just ours. Um, is there any, on that note, is there any other subjects related to, to Northern Ireland or the, the Troubles or, or even Bloody Sunday that you you think you'd want to undertake the, the project of, of creating a book again? I would love to write about Bally Murphy. So I would, because uh, it just, it's, not a lot of people outside Ireland know about it and they need to. I think not even, even inside just, Ireland for that matter. Yeah, yeah. And it is the culture of violence that I'm interested in. You know, the fact that it was allowed here and it was it was almost sanctioned or approved here. Go boys, do your job, teach them a lesson. So I think uh, I would like to, I, I'm really interested in miscarriages of justice and I'm really interested in giving people a voice when they've been historically overlooked, you know. So something like that, uh, real life stories, and it certainly. Mm. Excellent. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm interested in a similar thing. I I try to. Um, my favorite episodes are the ones um where I speak to people like like primary sources, we'll say p- people mm. who were there. And um, they, yeah. they, they, it's all it's always the best kind. Um, it's it worth mentioning. You 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 said earlier that if if the same thing had happened in you know Birmingham, Manchester, London, it would be it would be regarded. It, it would be it would be much much more well known, and it would be um, th- there would be a lot more weight to it, you know. And 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 I think it goes to show that like that like the British government and like major- majority of British people, if they were asked if you know if they were asked, um, is Northern Ireland part of Britain? They'll say yes because because they you, you kind of have to. It's 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 the answer, but but they really don't regard um, no. the cities as like as like as like British cities as they would. Yeah. You know, it, it, it like like you said, if it, if it happened in in a mainland UK city, to to be, hmm. I think, uh, yeah, I think we're very much considered the the poor relative here, aren't we? And we're almost like a nuisance, a millstone around um, Britain's neck now. So let us go. You know, well, not that I'm a big advocate for free Ireland, but I'm also not a an advocate for um being part of the UK when it's never done us any favors. You know, and. Uh, I think that's slowly changing now anyway because of Brexit and stuff. And one of the weird um, knock-on effects of Brexit is that it made Ireland even closer to a united Ireland accidentally. You know, nobody saw that coming. But I think it's that we're just disillusioned and disenchanted with what uh, England has to offer after all these years. And, and Northern Ireland is getting poorer and poorer and no investment. And we're very much, my mom and dad always talk about being second-class citizens. And it was only in recent years I realized, Jesus, right? And I think part of it was going to the the police telling the families who's getting prosecuted. You know, the prosecution decision. And I was there with my family whenever they got to say to all the families in this big room, nobody's getting prosecutions apart from soldier F stuff. And seeing that after all those years of fighting and knowing the evidence that's out there and knowing that it's pretty clear cut, that made me think, geez, we're fighting a losing battle. And it was the only time I ever thought we are second class citizens. This would never happen elsewhere, you know. So, I, essentially, you don't want this to be able to happen again, as well. Mm. Um, th- thank you very much now for all your time, um, knowledge, and personal. I Sorry, mean... it was all very general, but uh, you have to sort of be general when it comes to Bloody Sunday. There's so many details. Not, you know? not at all. I, I was going to say, like the, the fact, the fact that you have a family connection and you put together a book, you've interviewed over 100 people the, the the amount of knowledge that that you can bring to the the conversation is is immense so so, so thank you very much I, I appreciate it
No worries. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everybody. Of course. Um, anything um, anything you'd, you'd like to leave us with there? Any kind of parting words or thoughts? I don't know. I don't know. I think family history is really important. Mm. So, um, yeah, I'm doing a PhD on the important on the impact of storytelling here now, because in the absence of legacy work and investigations and justice, maybe all people have is to be able to be part of the, the social narrative and, and to have their stories and their reality recorded and documented. So that's sort of my passion. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much again. Um, all your time. Um, the I'll, I'll link the book. Um, book's excellent. Like I said, I'll link the book in the in the YouTube and the and the podcast description if, if anyone wants to have a look at it.